Some major liquor companies have pulled out of Oklahoma because of court rulings that allow their product to be sold out of state at cheaper prices. A federal judge's order has changed all that, at least for a while. And so now Buckingham, which makes the popular Cuddy Sark Scotch and other products, has decided to come back. Alcohol Beverage Control Board Director Richard Crisp says he wasn't surprised. He expects other companies to do the same. What does surprise him is the complexity of the liquor industry now. He says it's hard to know which law to enforce. And we have two preliminary injunctions issued by Judge Eubanks with respect to Somerset and Bacardi. And yesterday, the federal court, Judge Thompson, issued a temporary injunction for 10 days, uh, all three of which are in direct conflict with the uh, judgment of uh, Judge Cannon, because those decisions are in conflict one with the other. And uh, the ABC board cannot follow all of these orders. It has to be one way or the other, insofar as we are concerned. Otherwise, I might find myself in contempt Buckingham's cost to be reinstated was $1,800, a small price if Buckingham does a booming business in Oklahoma, especially during Christmas time. Bellashaw Action 4 at a liquor store in northwest Oklahoma City. After premature babies finally go home, they must be extensively tested every three months. This to keep track of their progress and to spot any problems early. And for Kathy and Joe Orr, the watching and worrying continued. For Becky Orr, this seemed like a game, but for her doctors, nurses, and parents, more like a test. Part of a very important series of tests. They are trying to determine if being born two months early with a birth weight of only two and a half pounds has damaged Becky's development. According to some studies, children like Becky run a 1 in 12 chance of having a severe mental or physical handicap, suffering from cerebral palsy of vision or hearing loss, epilepsy, or brain damage. There are also more subtle problems, difficult to predict. Learning disabilities, delayed language and speech development, perception problems, poor coordination. It's hard to determine Becky's chance to have these problems because they don't usually show up until the child goes to school. And there aren't as many children in school who are small and premature as Becky. Because until a few years ago, these types of premature babies didn't live. But Becky's checkup is encouraging. She pays attention to bells with her eyes. Her muscle tone is good. She's active. Oh, Becky. <laughs> Becky. Oh, really Good girl, come on. What you gonna do? Oh, look at this. That's what I was talking about. <laughs> you silly girl. Uh, Kathy Orr tried not to worry about her daughter. She tried to be satisfied with the simple fact Becky survived. Gobbledygook. <laughs> I think of her now like she, as if she would have been a full-term baby. Oh, there's times I'll watch her development and I'll be afraid that she's not developing as fast as she should. But Becky isn't expected to act like a seven-month-old. Her corrected age, her age if she had been born on time, is only five months, and that's the way she's tested and evaluated. And as she gets older, we expect her development to get closer and closer to her chronological age. Um, I don't see any, really any abnormalities now for, for Becky's corrected age right now. Those tests have to be repeated every three months. You can't say how long it's going to take a baby to catch up, quote, catch up in development. Each time we see the baby, there still may be a possibility later on that the baby will develop problems. Becky's future is still uncertain, but today the news is good. Joe and Kathy want to share that good news with the persons who they believe deserve the credit. There's no doubt in my mind that she's a miracle. And there's not a day goes by that I don't look at her and just think, thank you, Lord, for her. Bye. 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 You can go back to work sending more of them home. Yeah. Thousands of premature babies are born in Oklahoma each year, and their chances for survival are increasing, mainly because of the quality care such as they receive here at the Mercy Health Center Neonatal Care Center. There's not a better one in the country. I'm Jerry Adams, Action 4.
Your holiday air travel plans need to begin on the ground. The new parking facilities at Will Rogers Airport aren't open yet, so you might have to hunt for a suitable parking place. Allow some extra time for parking, and your holiday vacation will start out on the right foot. Speaking of time, travel experts suggest you plan to arrive at the ticket counter at least an hour before departure. You can count on some long passenger check-in lines this time of year. It's always best to purchase your ticket beforehand, and you can save yourself some trouble by placing identification tags on your luggage before it's time to check in. The little stickers are important. Nothing could ruin a vacation faster than losing your luggage. Even passenger security check lines are long at Christmas. You could be delayed 10 minutes or more during peak travel times. You can minimize your weight by removing all metal objects, such as keys from your pockets, before passing through the metal detector. After you arrive at your destination, expect a crowd at the baggage claim area. Beware, a lot of luggage looks alike. So keep your baggage claim check handy to make sure you don't accidentally grab someone else's bag. Remember, if not planned properly, Yuletide traveling can be a hassle. But with a little forethought, it can become the most rewarding trip of the year. Scott Wallace, Action 4, Will Rogers World Airport. Red Andrews began holding his annual Christmas dinners about 30 years ago. His was a rags to riches story and he wanted to share his wealth with the poor. Red died a few years ago, but the dinners continued and the people who come on Christmas Day are a part of his family. For many of the guests, the dinner was all the family they have. In less than a week, about 5,000 people will be here for Christmas dinner. Since Red Andrews held his first dinner 30 years ago, it's become an Oklahoma City tradition. Well, this year the economy has hurt even the charitable, and the Red Andrews dinner tradition may be in trouble. In years past, most of the food brought in for the feast has been donated by area corporations and businesses who shared Red Andrews' concern for the needy. This year, many of those businesses have felt the crunch of the economic woes themselves. Some of them have closed down, others just can't afford to contribute to the cause. Frankly, we're worried about it. We've never had this kind of problems before. It's always a little touch and go and, and a little bit shaky, but for example, uh, two years ago we had about 3,500 people. Last year we had about 4,500. This year we're expecting 5,000. So as the economy gets worse, more and more people are in a position where they sure could use a free Christmas dinner and some toys for the kids. But at the same time, we've got problems on our end, too, trying to raise enough money to pay for all of that. We've never really had to ask for a lot of contributions in the past. This year, we've got to, or we're not going to be able to continue it in the future. Even with the cut of the economic times, the food will be prepared this year, and dinner will be served. The organizers want to continue that, but they're afraid that the burden of Christmas giving may be too much. Charles Schnetzer, Action 4. Gallipoli is one of the best movies out right now. The title actually refers to a battle in World War I. In that clash, thousands of Australian soldiers were slaughtered by German and Turkish troops. Gallipoli is more than just a war picture, though. It's a story of friendship, development, maturing, and doing what you feel in your heart. It all focuses on two different Australian men. You can see how their relationship develops and how certain occurrences in the battle at Gallipoli affect them. The two men are Archie, played by Mark Lee, and Frank, portrayed by Mel Gibson. Frank is from the big city, and he's somewhat of a skeptic, whereas Archie is an idealist. Lee and Gibson give wonderful performances. They're also both runners. Frank doesn't really work at it, whereas Archie goes through long hours of training. These two characters are so different, and they're so believable. We can relate to them, their feelings. The film portrays both of them as eager, anxious young men willing to fight for their country. What's for breakfast? Brown biscuit porridge, porridge and, and fried, fried bully food. beef. Yeah. Well, if you've got the bacon like a crumb. You can't work miracles. So saying there's bacon around. Yeah. Well, there is, there is. Just got to give me some time to learn the ropes, that's all.
doesn't look too fierce to me. Oh, he's the midget of the family. The locations are simply beautiful. Gallipoli was directed by Peter Ware. His past works include Picnic at Hanging Rock and The Last Wave. He's a very talented director. All the performances in Gallipoli are excellent. The technical credits are 1A. The general theme of Gallipoli is quite simple. It shows us two different men thrown together, suffering through the bad times, the good times. It shows us, through the war, how people can change or not change. Gallipoli is an entertaining drama. It's impressive, and I highly recommend you see it over the holidays or whenever you get the chance. I'm Dino Lolly. Believe me, it's very hard to give a bad review to a movie starring two of the best comedic actors around and two of my favorites, Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon. But their current film, Buddy Buddy, is terrible. Why Matthau and Lemmon would do a movie like this is beyond me. What made you do it? That's what I keep asking myself. Come on, guys, let's get with the program. The gentleman in the middle is Billy Wilder, a wonderful director who's given us some very good movies. You would think this trio would spell success for a movie. Wrong. Forget it. Mathal stars as a hitman hired to knock off a hood, a squealer who soon will be walking into the courthouse across the street. Mathal's character is a cold, non-feeling old grouch. Jack Lemmon is somewhat of a squirrely, spineless man whose wife has left him. The wife is played by Paula Prentice. He's checked into the room next to Mathal to end it all. Of course, they meet, and Mathal becomes entangled in Lemmon's predicament. Bookies after you, terminal cancer, what? Terminal love. Love. You did it for a dame. But Celia's not a dame. She's my wife. Actually, she's my second wife. I left my first wife for Celia. So I gave up everything. The, the three kids, the house, and the insurance. The big, I owned a piece of the rock. And the two cars, and the Betamax, and... Now Celia's left me. That's tough. For some phony doctor. I think a doctor soccer broke. The, 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 Runs this fancy clinic. Uh, Institute for Sexual Fulfillment. That's a racket. That's what that is. She came up here to investigate it. Where is she? With the FBI? No, she's with CBS. You know, the research department. You know 60 Minutes? They were going to expose the whole setup. Next thing I know, she's not coming home. She falls for that quack. She walks out on me, walks out on a job. I get a nervous breakdown on ulcers. Now the whole thing is in my suicide note. Do you want to read it? No. I could drown myself, but he turned off the water. Listen, you give me any more trouble, and I'm going to strangle you with my bare hands. That's another solution. You're making it very difficult for me to like you. It's very difficult to like this movie, that's for sure. The script is lousy, the pace is so tedious it seems like the film goes on for days and days. And of course, the big thing is it's simply not funny. Mathau and Lemon don't appear to get into their characters. It looked like they were just going through the motions, mindlessly saying their lines. The comedy is forced and I could just go on and on. I'm gonna do it again. No, no, please. And again. You wouldn't. And again. Please don't make another film like this. Even if you're Lemon and Mathau fans, don't waste your time with this film. Buddy Buddy is lousy, lousy. I'm Dino Lolly. Absence of Malice deals with two things. They're both very controversial. One is the never-ending battle between a person's right to privacy and the public's right to know. The other is about truth printing the truth, particularly in investigative reporting. This movie might remind you a little of All the President's Men. It's not the same, but the similarities are there. Sally Field is a tough, capable newspaper reporter, Megan Carter. She writes a story about Michael Gallagher, portrayed by Paul Newman. Newman is the law-abiding son of a mobster, but because of his late father's ties with gangsters and the rackets, Newman has had to work extra hard in keeping a low profile. He runs a legitimate wholesale liquor company. Meanwhile, the head of a task force is investigating the disappearance of a longshore union leader, and he suspects Newman might be able to help on the case. So he leaks the story to Fields, who writes a story saying Newman is a prime suspect. Legally, there's no libel here because she got the story from a reliable source. 
So, all of a sudden, Gallagher's low-keyed, non-public life is on the front page. Newman tries to find out just exactly who's investigating him and why, but no one will tell him anything. Later on, there's an unexpected development. Newman and Field become romantically involved. That, of course, just complicates things even more. Field and Newman's performances are superb. The chemistry between the two really comes across to us. Somebody's trying to get to me. Somebody with no face and no name. You're the gopher. You listen to them, you write what they say, and then you help them hide. You say you got a right to do that, and I got no right to know who they are. Look, Gallagher, if they clear you, I'll write about that, too. What page? See, you say somebody's guilty, everybody believes you. You say he's innocent, nobody cares. That's not the paper's fault, it's people. People believe whatever they want to believe. Who puts out the paper? Nobody. Would you tell me the truth, Michael? I, I just please like to know the truth. Tell you or the whole world? What's the difference? The truth is the truth. No. You want to know the truth? Okay, you want to ask me as a person? I'll tell you. You ask me as a reporter? I got no comment. That's not fair. The other performances, Bob Babylon, John Harkins, Belinda Dillon, the rest of the cast, they're all excellent. We can get into their characters. They're real. But my favorite character is Wilford Brimley as the assistant attorney general. I think he steals the whole picture. You got a story in here, says strike force investigating the DA, suspecting bribes. It's the damnedest story you ever read. Nobody in this department ever read a story quite like that. Tell you what we're going to do. We're going to sit right here and talk about it. We had had a leak. You and... had a leak? You call what's going on around here a leak? Boy, the last time there was a leak like this, Noah built himself a boat. The one thing I did not like about the film is the way they presented Sally Field's character. Let's face some facts. Though she portrays an investigative reporter, she makes a lot of mistakes. Her reports are rather sloppy. But that's relatively minor. Overall, Absence of Malice is worth seeing. It's an intelligent, thought-provoking film. I'm Dino Lawley, and Merry Christmas. Judge Bohannon called Oklahoma's corrections officials into court to determine if they had violated his 1979 ruling that the state could house no more than one inmate per prison cell. Attorneys for the state had asked the judge to allow the double selling of some inmates to help alleviate prison overcrowding. Today, court-appointed fact finder John Albach testified about his observations of Oklahoma's prison system. He recommended that the state use every option other than double selling to solve its space problem. But Judge Bohannon declared that a very serious emergency exists in the state prison system. Criticizing the legislature for its inaction on the prison population problem, the judge granted a temporary one-year modification of his ban against double selling. He ruled that the state may house up to 300 inmates in double cells statewide, but the state will have to pay a fine of $1,000 a day for that privilege. The attorney representing Oklahoma prison inmates says today's decision shows that Bohannon won't back down from his previous ruling. Well, I'm very pleased. I think that the, the court's showing that he's actually serious about enforcing his orders. I think that the result of the hearing today is going to be compliance, and it's going to be compliance uh, at a pace that the, that the state can, can do it reasonably, but with the haste that the situation warrants. 
Corrections Director Larry Meacham says he'll have to consult with state lawmakers before making a decision on whether or when to begin double selling. To give us additional options, I have to now talk to the various leaders in the state to see how they want to respond because I would think that uh, if I'm going to do something that's going to cause a fine to the state, that the governor and the pro tem and the speaker better know about it before I take any action. Judge Bohannon left in a loophole in case the state finds the $1,000 a day fine too much of a burden. And the judge says all the state has to do is show him that it's acting in good faith to try to correct his overcrowding problem. And he'll consider modifying that fine. Scott Wallace, Action 4 at the Federal Courthouse. Over 800 people gathered tonight at the Messiah Lutheran Church in Oklahoma City. It was a beautiful candlelight service of scripture and song. Hearts and minds and voices joined together in remembering that cold, starry night many, many years ago that marked the birth of Jesus Christ. The Christmas message is a universal language, telling the story of a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes that changed the course of mankind. It's hard to imagine that the King of Kings had only a manger for a bed. There was no fanfare that night in Bethlehem for the Christ child so dear and gentle, but history shows the radiant beams from his holy face have shed light over the entire world, and people from all countries and nations celebrate his coming as the beginning of the forgiveness of sins. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let every heart prepare him room on Christmas morn. Carol Lambert, Action 4. The sport of shooting has been in existence for years. Although many people consider guns as recreation, more and more people are turning to their use for home safety protection. But in order to be a responsible gun user, it's necessary to learn and practice proper shooting techniques. The problem, however, is finding a place that's safe to fire real life bullets. Well, at the new H&H &H shooting range in Oklahoma City, people of all ages and occupations are finding a solution. The facility is equipped with top-rate security systems to prevent any shooting mishap. Owner Miles Hall says the idea behind the range is to cut down on unnecessary shooting accidents. Safety has got to be the biggest single thing. There's a lot of people who own guns here in Oklahoma City and really don't know all there is to know about how to use it properly or where to store it or how to clean it. And that's the other idea. We're going to teach these people, and as well as providing a safe place for them, teach them how to use that gun properly and keep from having these accidents that you hear so much about. In addition to the practice shooting range, Hall is offering courses in various areas of firearm safety.
Charges of grade fixing in Oklahoma City's Air Traffic Training Academy are becoming more intense. The United States Inspector General is planning a trip to the Academy at the recommendation of a congressional investigating team. While they are here, they will look into the charges and determine what FAA officials, if any, were involved in possible wrongdoing. In their 17-page report, the House Committee on Post Office and Civil Services says there is substantial evidence that records of 14 students who originally failed were altered so that those students would pass and that an additional 12 computer sheets were altered. The investigators believe that grade changes were made to improve the Academy's sagging public image. Administrators at the school say grades were changed because of computer grading error and questionable lab scores. But the congressional report says the information developed does not support this version. Administrators say the machine used was unreliable, but the report again says the machine performed flawlessly later in the day. Finally, the report says there was ample motivation for Academy officials to try to increase the number of students who passed. The administrators at the FAA Academy are refusing comment on the report. The public information officer is on leave. In short, no one's talking around here except to say that they won't talk. In the meantime, at the recommendation of this report, the U.S. Inspector General is planning a trip to Oklahoma City in the middle of next month. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, at the FAA Academy. Oklahoma and Kansas produce half the wheat in this country. For Oklahoma, it's 200 million bushels a year. Under the new farm bill, if wheat is embargoed, the government would have to make up the difference in price on the market and parity. Wheat would have a 30 to 40 billion dollar price tag in Oklahoma and Kansas alone. Farmers were angry when the Carter administration used wheat as a weapon, and using wheat exclusively now would be very expensive for the government. And that's why Oklahoma's Agriculture Commissioner thinks all food should be included in an embargo, not just wheat. But I think we have to keep in mind that farm products, farm commodities are the one thing that this country has lots of, that we are the kings when it comes to agriculture production. So we have to uh, play with what our strengths are. And uh, if we want to give the uh, products to the Polish people, uh, I kind of favor the way of going through the uh, organized relief agencies and give it directly to the people if that's possible. made from costly varietal grapes, harvested in some of the world's finest growing regions. Oklahoma television viewers haven't seen them since 1959. They are wine advertisements, and they've been illegal in this state since the end of Prohibition. The Oklahoma Telecasters Association began the battle to advertise in April of this year, and last week they won. We believe, and I think all of the Telecasters believe, that you or any other viewer should have the right to view a commercial uh, dealing with wine, alcohol, substances. But to go one step further than that, we believe that we as a business should not be hampered by an old law that should have been passed a long time ago. We're here to make a profit. This is potential new revenue to us. Let's not uh, kid anyone about that. But the constitutional legality of us being able to view, to show that commercial and have that right guaranteed to us in the First Amendment. Also, some viewers have expressed some concern over seeing hard liquor advertisements. They're mistaken. This ruling deals only with wine and beer beverages containing over 3.2 percent alcohol. In fact, ABC director Richard Crisp says it's his understanding that no television station in the country runs hard liquor advertisements. And there's no telling how long we'll be seeing the wine commercials in Oklahoma the state attorney general's office says it will appeal the ruling. Sherry Sellers, Action 4.
The trouble began around 11 o'clock last night when two black males robbed a Pizza Hut restaurant in Chickasha. Authorities say the suspects got away in a red and white Cadillac and they fled eastbound towards Purcell. Well, rookie police officer Steve Samu stopped the pair about midnight last night. It began when I found out it was them that was the subjects in, involved in the bur robbery. At that time, when I stopped the vehicle, gunshots at that time were exchanged. And then just a, sh a regular shootout. Following the shootout, one of the robbers broke into a nearby house and forced a bystander there to drive him to Oklahoma City. The hostage was later released unharmed. Purcell police detectives found some interesting evidence in the suspect's Cadillac, including a fistful of dollars still in the Pizza Hut bank bag and enough ammunition to supply a small army.